Thank you all for coming to the Climate Change Leadership Conference in Porto. Uh, thank you for, for coming back from coffee to, to see the, the final session of the morning. Uh, did, you, was the, did you get some coffee? Were you able to, to do it? So you're, so you're fortified. This is very good. So, so what we're going to try to do here today, and we're going to do it so well that if I didn't tell you, you wouldn't know is that we're going to cram our 45 minutes worth of presentations into about a half an hour. And so if it, if it looks like our, we've lost control over the clicker and we're just moving ahead, it's, there's a strategy to this today. So um, our, the um, session, Efficiency and Economics, A Call to Action, uh, we have three, uh, well, two interesting speakers and me. Uh, the, uh, I'm here today to set the table, to, to set the stage for our presentations. And then Stephen Ranekleve from Rabobank will speak. And then finally, Robert Swack from PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, I uh, call my presentation in the longer version, uh, Second Thoughts on Economics, Climate Change, and Wine, uh, because part of our problem uh, for the people in this room is that uh, People are attached to so many myths and stereotypes. And so while we are calling them to action, uh, there is an intellectual component to this. We need to have people rethink, rethink what they think they know about the environment and its relationship to almost everything else. And so I uh, approach this with my funny uh, bipolar or split personality. If you go on uh, Amazon.com, and you look for Mike Viseth, the, the guy in that the handsome, talented, charming guy who is here today, uh, you get the fellow who is, writes about the wine business. Uh, 2001 book, uh, Wine Wars, it was JancisRobinson.com's wine book of the year. Who knew that people would read about the wine business? And my most recent book, Around the World in 80 Wines, there's a chapter on it called A Rainy Day in Porto. And you know how that chapter will work out. So that's, that's who, who the guy who is here today. If instead you search for Michael V. Seth, well, you get the professor guy. And so he's the guy that writes about globalization and about financial crises and uh, four different series of, of, uh, of textbooks. I was at a conference in London with Adrian a few years ago, and he pulled me aside and said, get rid of Mike. I want to talk to Michael for just a little bit. Do you remember that, Adrian? You know this? So, you didn't see this. Here we go. Part of, the, um, part of the intellectual problem that we face, that I face as a practicing wine economist, is that uh, in, the, in academia, knowledge is divided up according to different disciplines. And the disciplines take what we know and they, they uh, put it into finer and finer uh, categories or silos, we call them in the United States, and so that uh, knowledge becomes fragmented, and we think we can understand it all when we're only looking at a piece of it. And this just doesn't work. This just doesn't work anymore. It hardly works in any, in any element at all. Uh, my academic specialty, interdisciplinarity, of uh, breaking down silos, forging connections, is, is, uh, is I think, a, a powerful movement in academics. And it's true in the case of uh, climate change as well. Because we think of economics is all about profit, and ecology is all about nature. But if you look at the root of these words, well, they come from the same thing, from the Greek word ekos, which is, which is the household. And you can't manage your household by just looking at your bank accounts. You can't manage your, your household by just seeing what's happening in the bathroom. Your, your, your household or your business household <coughs> or your community household is a complex interdependent system. And all of the accounts, the social account, the environmental account, the economic accounts, all of these accounts must be balanced together or it's simply unstable. It simply falls apart. The household is a complicated place. The uh, Nobel Prize Committee, we give a Nobel, an honorary Nobel Prize um, in economic science for about the last 30 years. 
And you may have noticed that the Nobel Committee decided to recognize the importance of this complex interdependence in 2018 when they gave the Nobel Prize to the American uh, William Nordhaus. And Nordhaus is the, <clears throat> the architect of economic uh, models and forecasts that explicitly take the climate into account. They explicitly take the constraints that the, um, that the climate presents. They explicitly take the fact that climate decisions today have economic consequences that extend into the future. And it happened now that the, the benefits you might get from cutting a corner here create costs down the line. And that the household accounts can't be balanced at all without explicitly taking this all into account. Now, I'm telling you this, but you don't need to have me tell you this because you get it. Isn't that a term that has been used several times uh, in, yesterday and today? That the people in this room, we get it. We understand that you need to consider the economy and the environment together. Uh, you need to see actions against climate change as opportunities, not just costs to go with this. And so we get it, but as a, as a, on my economics professor side, the question is I have to ask is why do we get it? I mean, we can just say we're special, or we are a lot smarter than the people outside. But uh, in my study of financial crises, uh, I, we, we, we uncover what's called the this time is different effect, that you see a, a financial bubble going and people say, don't worry, this time is different. It won't explode. It's never different. There's always something. So why, why are we in the wine industry? Why are we enlightened, so interested in the climate change? Why is this, it's a cell, but it is not the hardest cell. Even, even radical ideas uh, are, are get a, a hearing for this. Well, one reason, as I tried to think of it, one reason maybe comes from the plants. Uh, we plant grapevines. Grapevines will live for a generation productively, can live for 100 years, can live more. Planting a grapevine is not a quarterly profit decision. Planting a grapevine is a generational commitment. So maybe this influences us unintentionally. Uh, a second idea I have, and I've written about this, I wrote about this in um, Around the World in 80 Wines, is have you noticed that in the wine industry, even at the global level, even at very large important firms, that family firms dominate in the wine industry to an extent that's far different from any other global industry of similar size. Uh, just if you look in Porto, for example, Taylor's, Sograppa, the Geddes family, um, the Symington family, and, and of course, on this stage, we have seen uh, Miguel Torres and the Torres family and Katie Jackson, the Jackson family, and, 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 and inviting the families to come together. And you know, I think, that it's not, of course, it's not just family businesses because there are um, uh, public corporations that make those sort of long-term commitments like families do. But in the wine industry, family firms rule, family firms dominate. And why is that again? Well, it's because I think of this generational thinking. You're not, you're, you can, uh, you have the combination of a generational vision and then the family organization that is able to take action to assess risk and move ahead in, uh, in very quick and direct ways. In Around the World in 80 Wines, I compared uh, uh, Penfolds, which began to make very quality wines. Uh, that the winemaker did it in secret because the corporate board didn't want to take the risk of making still wines. With Hensky, where the family simply decided we're going to make the best wines we can. They both ended up doing it, but the family firm was very good there. So that's, that's another reason. But you know, I think the real reason is because we are such a fragile industry that the grapevines are, are hardy, 
but the great industry is fragile. No one has to buy our product. With the anti-alcohol movements, many people are shunning the product. Uh, the, uh, it, it's a fragile industry because the grapevines cannot get up and walk to, uh, to get a better view of the, of the riverbank and so forth. And if I had more time, which I don't, I was going to talk about South Africa, which is, I believe, to be a pretty... How many of you have been to South Africa? I know some of you are... Some, so, so South Africa, a fragile household. Don't you agree? Socially fragile, economically fragile, with the drought we know environmentally fragile as well. And so I have taken inspiration from what family wine firms in South Africa have done to address the fundamental risks that their household uh, faces all of the time. So another day we will talk about South Africa. And so, I conclude my little section here with a call to action, but it's maybe not the one that you expect. It's not calling for you to do more and to do better, because others have done that, and you're going to do it. That's why you're here. You think this way already. You get it. No, I call on you as an industry to do more than that. To, in economics, we talk about how industries have backward linkages, backward linkages in the supply chain, the uh, transportation, the packaging, the corks, Antonio, for example. Uh, and we have forward linkages. As Adrian said in the opening remarks, we're the only branded agricultural product. So we have branding influence onto consumers. So I call upon you to take action with your suppliers, with your uh, future markets, with markets downstream, to influence the consumers, to, to make them get it as well.